This year, at the end of spring, I moved into my first real home in East St. Louis, Illinois. I was gearing up to move in early 2020, but then you know what hit, and like most other people on the planet, all my plans got put on hold. I had to juggle some finances, find a job, all without dipping into the savings intended to buy my starter home. But eventually, just over two years later, I was finally able to move in. The thing that made it real for me was the fact that I have my own backyard now, something that my six-year-old schnauzer really appreciates. He doesn't have to wait to go to the dog park to stretch his legs or roll around in the grass, and as gross as it sounds, he actually has a place to go to the bathroom whenever he wants. It's become part of our daily routine. I'll let Polly, that's his name, out first thing in the morning, once at lunchtime and then once before I go to bed. For months, the worst thing that would happen is that I'd have to clean up Polly's you-know-what, but then in July, something legit terrifying happened that made me think the whole world was ending. It was July, just after 10 p.m. at night, and I had just let Polly out into the backyard to take a dump. It was a nice warm evening and I was scrolling through my phone as Polly sniffed around for the right spot. Only it wasn't just regular dumb scrolling. There was something very particular on my mind and I found that every time I picked up my phone, I'd gravitate back to the same grim topic. Nuclear war. You might have seen a lot about it in the media this year, all prompted by the invasion and Putler's ambiguousness on whether or not to actually use weapons of mass destruction. Now call me a fraidy cat or whatever, but it was something that really took up a lot of my headspace this summer. I even saw a PSA from New York advising people on what they should do in the event of a nuclear attack. And since the authorities evidently deemed the threat to be a credible one, I started getting increasingly anxious over it. So as I said, I started scrolling through some news articles on the chances of a nuclear strike occurring on American soil when, all of a sudden, the whole of my backyard was lit up by this bright orange glow. I looked up to see this giant fireball rising into the sky, then a second later, boom, this huge explosion sends Polly running back into the house while yelping at the top of his little yappy voice. I just reacted, running back into my house behind Polly all the while thinking it's happening, it's happening, oh my god, it's actually happening. Polly was still freaking out and I had to grab him before rushing down into the basement expecting that the shockwave was going to hit at any moment. But obviously, that didn't happen. There was no shockwave, because there was no bomb. What actually happened was that a chemical plant, one that was actually pretty close to me, had caught fire and there had been an explosion. But in my mind, the explosion had looked much further away, and given how paranoid I was about Russian warheads, and the way poor Polly reacted when he heard the explosion, I guess I was just primed to overreact. I know, I know, I must seem like a total nutcase, but that explosion was so loud. It made every 4th of July show seem like a cap gun, and it literally made the ground shake when it hit. I think I would have freaked out even if I hadn't been obsessing over geopolitical situations, but having all of that on my mind made it one of the most terrifying moments of my whole life. I guess I need to pay less attention to the media. It's been doom and gloom for so long, I guess I just overloaded myself. But in that moment, seeing that fireball in the sky, it honestly felt like the world was ending. My family and I are from Australia, and back in 2007, we decided to take a month-long holiday to America. We traveled from LA up the west coast and then back down through Nevada. We did this by renting a car and doing the whole vacation road trip style. One night, we were traveling towards Lompoc and stopped in Santa Barbara for the night to sleep. We drove around a while looking for a decently priced motel that wasn't to bring your own UV light if you know what I mean. And my mom and dad found a place that looked okay and went inside to inquire about the price of a room for the night while my sister and I stayed in the car and listened to music on our iPods. We were bopping along to the Frey album that I had bought that day when my sister removed her headphones and said, Look at mom. What is she doing? I looked out the window and can see into the reception of the motel and see my dad talking to the manager and my mom displaying very cold and odd body language. She's usually very friendly with staff everywhere, so this was odd for her. 
What's wrong with her? I said to my sister as we kept a close eye on them. My mom was standing behind my dad with her arms crossed and looking around the place as if she was on guard for something, as if her hypervigilant senses had kicked in. After some time, my mom and dad get back in the car and discuss what to do about staying the night. My dad stated that we couldn't find any cheaper for the night and he was hungry and ready for dinner, so we better just stay here, plus it was the last room available, so we would have to make a quick decision. To his dismay, my mom disagreed. I don't like this place. I have a bad feeling, said my mom. My dad argued on, getting more and more irritated that my mom couldn't explain what she didn't like about the place, until my mom finally snapped and yells over my dad saying, We are not staying here. Fine, my dad screams back. And he says this as he starts the car and backs out of the motel driveway. At this point, my sister and I are looking at each other like, what in God's name just happened? But we stay quiet as mom seems on edge. Anyway, we end up finding a place to stay that mom approved of and bunkered down for the night. In the morning, we were bustling around the motel room, getting ready for the day when my dad turns up the TV to hear a news story about a shooting at the motel my mom didn't want to stay at. It turns out about 15 minutes after we left, a couple walked in and booked that last room, and the man that was behind them shot them because they took that last room. We all turned to look at my mom who was standing there wide-eyed, watching in horror. I told you I had a bad feeling about that place, she said to my dad who was just pretending not to listen. Moral of the story, always trust your intuition. On June 3rd, 2016, I had a social media event. I was an Instagram influencer and the event was a golf tournament. I posted on social to ask followers to come, so when he showed up it didn't surprise me. Sure, the tickets were $250, but for some reason that didn't click with me. It was a drinking event as well, and he showed up at least tipsy, but having a good time. He was also an Instagram model who I knew online. He asked me out on a date for after the tournament. I was a single mom, and because of the event, my parents were watching the kid until the next day, so I said sure. We went off on the date, went to a bar and grabbed some food. The man was handsome, but mostly charming as heck. We had a beer, then in his car he offered some weed. I rarely smoked, but decided what the heck. We hotboxed, then went off to a bar. He was friendly with everyone and made me laugh quite a few times. Then off to the liquor store for more alcohol and finally to his house. I was drunk and high, so it was easy to sleep with me. He had a bunk bed and I remember him being on top and being very selfish and aggressive and being scared, I just didn't stop him out of fear. He had driven and my car was still at the golf tournament location and we were far too far for me to afford an Uber back to my car. The next morning I went to the restroom and afterward noticed a long pipe coming from the toilet after I flushed. He seemed to come out upset saying that the pipe was messed up and it was used to water the weed him and his roommate were growing. I didn't know what was going on and I was too drunk and high to really have anything click and I just apologized deeply and was scared. We came downstairs and I looked at the walls and decor for the first time. Knives and weapons were used as decorations all over the house and I waited for him to have breakfast and drive me back to my car, trying not to show really any panic. In the car I needed an excuse that wouldn't hurt his feelings. I told him I had a blast and I'm so bummed because I really like him but my child's father passed away when he was one, which is true, and I can't have CPS take him away because I'm around someone growing weed. I told him I didn't care about the weed and I didn't want him to change so it was a bummer. I let him make out with me at least one last time as he dropped me off. I was shaking as I drove off because of the vibes. The very next day, after he dropped me off, he met a girl that was 10 years our junior and an 18 year old mini me. He dated her for 3 weeks I guess and she dumped him and he stalked her like crazy. So much so he was arrested a few times. In September of the same year. He gets out of jail the last time and heads to a bar, meets a girl there and takes her home. He ends up murdering her, chopping up her body, cutting her heart out, and setting it on fire. 
He's currently serving life for his crime. And I'll tell you something, I get flashbacks all the time. I don't even know where to start because it never occurred to me that something like that was possible. But here I am. Ever since I was three years old, I knew one girl, I'm going to call her Emma, because we were in the same group in kindergarten. Later, we attended the same school. We were never really close until we turned nine or ten because we got into the same group of friends and soon we became best friends, not surprising for that age. We'd hang out a lot, literally spent all the free time with each other. I knew that Emma had problems at home. Her mom was an alcoholic and an addict, even though she denied it all the time. Most of the time we'd spend on the streets, however, rarely we'd stay at my place when it was raining or during storms and blizzards. But we never entered her apartment when someone was at home and even then never stayed for longer than 10 minutes. My mother suspected that she was stealing stuff, a pair of golden earrings went missing and we never found them again, and just asked me to be more careful around her. Eventually I noticed what my mother meant. Emma would come up with crazy excuses to stay in my apartment, like saying that if we go under the rain, she would catch a cold during her period and in the future she wouldn't be able to give birth due to that. I wasn't a dumb kid, but just decided not to point out her ridiculousness. One summer afternoon, I decided to bring up the topic of Emma's family again. She took me to her home and no one was there. Everything went normal, so we started hanging out there more often. I noticed a lot of empty bottles and syringes around, but it wasn't my place to pry. A few days after that, when we entered, I noticed two extra pairs of shoes that weren't there before, and when we left the door frame, I saw a woman and a man sitting in a kitchen and smoking. I knew that Emma didn't have a father. He died when she was two or so, so I assumed that it was her mother's friend. Is that? And then she said my name. You changed a lot. Such a pretty face. I was so weirded out as she and that man stared at me intently, eyeing up my body and face. I was ten, so only later I understood how creepy it truly was. I'm pretty sure that I'd never met her mother before, so probably she saw me in a kindergarten album or something. After that encounter, Emma started acting really strange, asking my parents full names, where exactly they worked, whether I have extended family, persuading me to go to abandoned places. She literally dragged me to her place several more times where I met her mother and that man again. Weird comments, especially about my body and face, happened every time. I told my mother about Emma's behavior. I didn't tell about that weird stuff with her mother and she banned me from hanging out with Emma completely. It's important to note, after me and Emma stopped talking, she transferred to another school by the demand of her mother. It was a regular morning, a month or two after I stopped talking with Emma. I headed out to school when, suddenly, an old beaten up car pulled up near me and a woman came out of it. I couldn't see her face clearly due to the scarf around her face and I assumed that she was just a passenger getting out of the car so I continued my way towards the school. However, I haven't even made more than a step when she firmly grabbed my arm. She started saying something about my mother being in the hospital and that I need to go with her. Her voice seemed familiar and the rest of the face too. She also said the full names of my parents and that she's related to me from my uncle's side. She said his name too. I freaked out and started denying her demand to get in the car, so she grabbed my shoulder placed her palm on my mouth and dragged me to the car. And that's when I saw the driver was that man from Emma's place. I bit the woman's hand as hard as I could, thrashed until she let go and ran back home as hard as I could. My mother came home furious after she was alerted that I never got to school, but she quickly calmed down when she saw my state. My clothes were torn on the sleeve, my arm heavily bruised, and I was sobbing. I was never an emotional kid, rarely showed even mild emotions, I explained everything that happened and she showed me all the photos of relatives and asked if I recognized the woman and I didn't. My mother hasn't said a word to me about that after and we pretended it never happened. Today I stumbled across Emma's Facebook and there was a photo of her mother with that disgusting scarf. I denied the possibility that was her throughout my whole childhood, but here it was, proof that it makes it impossible to lie to myself anymore. I need to let it out because my mother never got me any psychological help after this and I just bottled it up. Why did Emma's mother do that? 
did Emma know about it? But I guess I won't ever know. My family and I had a caravan in a holiday park in New South Wales. We would go there every school holidays and there were many kids that I used to run around and play with. I have fond memories of this place where I learned to ride a bike and had my first kiss, but other memories are not as good and now leave me with that egg flip feeling in my stomach. The people that owned the caravan park had a son. He was roughly 25 years old and I would have been around 5 or 6. He would drive around the park and collect everyone's rubbish on a tractor and do other odd jobs like this to help out his parents. Every once in a while, he would pull up when I was playing out front and ask if I wanted to ride on the tractor. I, being young and naive, of course, accepted and jumped on because what child doesn't want to ride on a tractor? This was back in the days where parents would let their children play in the streets without much supervision and you just came back home when the street lights came on. One day, when he dropped me back to our van, my dad came storming out, grabbed me by the arm and yanked me off the tractor. Without saying a word to the man, he took me inside and told me to never, ever hang out with him again. I don't want you hanging around this man again, he said without saying why. But he's nice, he, he gives me lollies, I said. Just don't, I'm telling you, don't talk to him, he replied. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me talking to the nice man who only gave me a tractor rides and gave me lollies and hugs and sometimes the occasional sandwich. I remember telling the man one day, My dad said I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. To which he smirked and replied, Oh yeah? Why's that? Fast forward nearly 13 or 14 years later, and my family and I are watching the news when the man's face flashes across the screen attached to a story where he had killed two people and is now serving time in prison. My dad said, Look at this, look at this. I knew he was bad news. There was always just something about him. Do you remember when he used to take you around on that tractor? My blood ran cold and my stomach dropped. The most disturbing part, he killed people with pills that he would call his lollies. Please always listen to your parents. My God, I would be dead by now if it wasn't for my dad. A few years ago, about 2019, I was riding the bus one night to get home. There was a guy on the bus that was a little disheveled and dirty, reeked of alcohol and generally acting weird. I was sitting in the back and he sat near me and tried to talk to me. I was polite at first. I rode the bus at night a lot so a drunk homeless guy doesn't really bother me and I have no problem making small talk with a stranger on the bus. Plus I'm used to there being one or two sketchy people on the bus considering the route and the fact that it's late at night. When he tried to get flirty I told him I wasn't interested and put my headphones back in my ears and ignored him. He got a little frustrated and even said some vulgar things but I couldn't really hear him so it seemed fine. It's not my first rodeo being in that kind of situation and while it's uncomfortable and there's nothing okay about that sort of behavior, I rarely feel threatened. Most of the time they are harmless, all bark and no bite and I'm a big girl, as in tall and overweight and I know basic self-defense and always have an exit strategy when in scenarios where I don't feel safe. When people get like that on the bus, I find most of the time ignoring them and acting like I'm not phased is enough for them to get bored and find somewhere else to go. I only engage if they get in my face or start harassing other passengers, especially other women, kids and seniors or anyone who appears vulnerable, because I will not tolerate that. And the bus drivers usually don't put up with that either if it escalates enough. Anyway, this random drunk homeless guy would have been just one of many random drunk homeless guys if it weren't for what happened next. So my stop is coming up, and I'm looking forward to going home. I am exhausted and so ready to get to bed. I pull the cord to indicate that I want off on the next stop and he gets up and walks to the front to talk to the driver and then laughs loudly. I don't think much of it except I'm a little wary and thinking, please don't tell me we're getting off at the same stop. As the bus slows down and I'm waiting at the back door to be let off at the stop, instead of opening the back door, he opens the front door and the guy gets off. 
I ask the driver to open the back door and I see him shake his head in the mirror and annoyed. I walk to the front and get off there but he closes the door before I can get off and starts driving. Angrily I say, what are you doing, that's my stop. The driver replies, I'm sorry, but I can't in good conscience let you off at the same stop as that guy. Either get off at the next one or wait until we get to a transit station and take a bus going the other way. Not getting it, I ask, why? Because of what he said to me, he says. I ask what he said and the driver just says, nothing I'd like to repeat, ever. I'm so sorry, but just trust me. The driver actually looks shaken and considering the tone of his voice and the look on his face, as frustrated and anxious as I was to get home, I trusted him and took his word for it. I caught another bus going the other way at the next terminal and watched the driver radio dispatch to get some peace officers and transit security to patrol the area near that stop. They were parked in the parking lot near the stop when I finally got off and I was extra paranoid and on high alert as I walked the next couple of blocks to my apartment that night, fortunately without further incident. I never saw that guy again and I'm okay with that. And to this day I wonder exactly what he said to the driver. It bugs me not knowing, but at the same time, maybe it's better that way. Either way, the implications are enough to freak me out, and I'm so thankful for whatever the bus driver must have stopped that day. This is actually my first ever post. Something creepy happened to me, a female, 26 years old, in 2020. This is back when just about everything was closed down due to the pandemic and I was still studying to be a teacher. One of the requirements for teaching is to pass the RICA exam, which is a four hour long test that is commonly taken at a testing center. I found a testing location that was still open and made an appointment. Since COVID regulations were in effect, I was told prior to arriving that test takers could use the lockers to store their belongings. I don't know, I guess sanitation issues or something. Anyway, my mom offered to drive me to the test site and said that she would pick me up after to grab lunch. And this is important because A, I didn't drive, and B, I decided to leave my phone with my mom because it would be easier with the lockers not being in service. I finished my exam about 10 minutes before the 4 hour time limit ends and went outside to wait for my mom. I expected her to be right outside in the parking lot because she's usually early to arrive to most things but she wasn't. No big deal. I decided to stand in the middle of the parking space on the opposite side of the lot facing the building. I noticed a man who was dressed in a suit walking into the lot from a path between the testing site and another building that was in the center. He didn't acknowledge me and got into his car that was parked a few spots over to my left. He backed out of the spot and started turning his car in my direction, which was also the opposite direction of the only exit this parking lot had. I knew something was wrong, but... Before I could start making my way back to the testing site, he blocked the parking spot that I was standing in with his car. He had his passenger window rolled down and started to tell me how beautiful my hair was. I said, thank you, and he started to say other things, but I couldn't make it out because he began speaking softer. I felt myself taking a step forward naturally to try to make out what he was saying, but stopped because I realized that that was probably what he wanted, me closer to the car. He must have noticed my apprehension because he then began negotiating a friendship saying he was from Uganda and that he needed someone to show him around. This interaction lasted less than 30 seconds and ended abruptly when out of nowhere he put his car in reverse and just dipped out of the parking lot. Now that his car was out of the way, I was able to see that two workers from the test site had exited the building at some point and were yelling for me to come inside. They saw the interaction, thought it looked off, and offered that I wait for my mom in the lobby. Has anything like this happened to anyone before? Any men in nice clothes with nice cars saying they are Ugandan with accents to back it up, acting predatory? It really bothers me because young adults frequent these types of testing sites all the time and leave dazed and vulnerable after sitting through four hours of exams, many times with nothing on them but an ID like me. Did this man know that? And are there others out there stalking out test sites for no reason? Did those proctors save me from being trafficked? A few years ago, 
I, a 19-year-old female at the time, used to live in apartments across the street from a grocery store. I worked nights and needed to get a few groceries after work in the AM. If I didn't need many things, I'd just walk instead of drive, and this was one such occurrence. It was early enough, I'd say about 8 a.m.-ish, and I'm browsing the store. I grabbed a really nice measuring cup, sort of like an impulse buy, and this is important later on. Toward the end of my shopping, I'm grabbing the last few items. I passed the same man at least twice, it could have been more before I started to notice, and he would pass me and dip into the aisle right behind the aisle that I would go in. The last thing I needed was milk, which was at the back of the store. Again, I passed the guy. On my way to the checkout stands, I decided not to get the measuring cup. Here comes the guy again, going into the aisle right behind the aisle I went in. The measuring cup was at the front of the aisle, and I was there no more than 10 seconds before I was out of the aisle going to the checkout stands, and the guy was out of his aisle and passed me again. I continued on to the self-checkouts that were currently full, and so I stood in line. You know how people talk about gut feelings? Well, I suddenly felt extremely sick, like I was going to vomit and even got a cold sweat. I turned around and saw that the same guy was right behind me. His basket looked empty and only had a couple of things. I was too panicked to really count. People were lined up behind him and a self-checkout became available. I glanced at the shopping basket and very audibly said, Ah, shoot! Like I forgot something and went off back into the store in a hurry. I'm pretty sure it would have been out of place for him to suddenly follow me, but I don't know exactly what he did. I didn't look back. I circled around the entire store and came back to the checkout lines that were empty now. I quickly scanned all of my items and rushed out of the store among the small crowd of other shoppers. I saw a brown paneled van parked near the entrance, and I'm 90% sure that it was the same guy, but I could have just been paranoid. He was looking down, I'm guessing at a phone, and I ducked behind a different parked car and almost sprinted back to my apartment, and to this day it's the most intense gut feeling that I'd ever had. I was around 8 years old. I was playing Super Mario 64 in my room at night, probably at around 8 or so, and I had a large window, like two normal windows side by side. The blinds were down, but they were open so you could see the darkness outside. While I was playing, I was feeling weird like I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked to the left, and I clearly saw the outline of a white t-shirt in the window, it looked like the size of an adult. I remember being frozen still and hair standing up on my skin. I was petrified, and it felt like minutes but was only a second. I dropped my controller and ran out of the room telling my mom immediately. Just as that was happening, I remember my dad pulling into the driveway. He said he saw nothing and checked around the whole house and everything and still nothing. But I was so scared though. I tried to even tell myself it was a reflection from something in the room, but I knew what I saw. I tried to sit in the same spot a few days later to recreate a reflection that would look like that, but nothing caused that look. I knew someone was watching me. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Yesterday, my daughter, 8 years old, and I took our pup out for her 2pm walk just like every day. Being on a schedule is good for my dog, yet I may have to switch it up now. As a guy in my complex asked to take a picture of my dog for his friend, and I said sure. So he runs down and started a whole photo shoot. He told us to all get in the picture, which we ignored. No need to take a picture of my 8 year old. He got permission to get a picture of my dog. And he kept saying, oh I can get a better picture than that. Here I was, just like getting more and more uncomfortable. Like my dog is high energy, she wants to get going and so do I. And finally he seems happy with the picture and says to wait, he has cookies. Wasn't clear if they were for my daughter or dog, but I was done with this interaction. So I said, uh, no thanks, my daughter has a kids party to attend. He seemed to look defeated and asked if I was sure. And I said, yep, gotta go. And just hustled out of there. This could be innocent, but it felt really odd, and I have a very unique looking dog who always has her face in the window, so 
It would be very easy to pinpoint where we live, and everyone has a key to our first door since we live in the same entrance as the basement storage. We still have two locked doors after that first door, but I just feel unnerved. We live like a minute walk from that guy's house, and I just want to see what you guys think about this. Is it weird, or am I just being paranoid? This is something that happened to me a couple of years back that still freaks me out when I think about it. To start with this, it was around midnight and I was in my room browsing stuff on my phone when I suddenly hear what sounds like knocking outside my bedroom window. I'm at ground level. I first shrugged it off as being a squirrel or something until I heard the same sounds again, which is when I started becoming concerned. It was at this point that I left my room and called my dad to tell him about what was happening. He tried to reassure me that it was nothing, and while this was happening, I heard even more knocking coming from around the front door. I tried calling out to see if it was my brother or anything, but didn't get any answers. At this point, I was starting to really freak out. It was after this that I heard someone at my back door trying to force the door open. It was locked, thankfully, and finally, after this, my dog finally caught on and started barking like crazy at the other end of the door, which finally drove whoever was out there off. After what happened, I called my grandpa, who lived a block over, to come and pick me up because I was too scared to be able to stay the night in that house. In retrospect, I should have called the police, but I wasn't thinking straight, and was shivering on the couch holding a kitchen knife the whole time I was waiting for him. I still have no idea who was out there that night. I had taken a walk alone in a nature trail earlier that day, and my only working theory is that someone had followed me home. I later learned that there were drifters living in the woods around that era, which adds to that theory. I have no evidence of that, though. And this is probably the scariest experiences I've been through, and it still makes it hard for me to stay home alone at night. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short dead-end street 10 plus miles from a town, and there were seven houses in the area spread out on two and a half acre wooded lots or larger each. There were no large wild animals, there aren't any bears or similarly large animals in the region, and people didn't meander there or show up lost. Actually lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years I lived there, so please keep that in mind. When I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was, and he would sometimes tromp over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from the gravel area outside my window to have a chat. My bed was right next to the window. I'd open the window and we'd whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and his house was to the side could see his house from the window over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway. I'd often know if he was out. The light was on over the side door entrance or already home as the light was off. One time during the summer when my window was open I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old and it was around midnight. I'd hear Terry get out of his car and was talking to his friends. Soon his friends pulled away. I softly called out as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond as he didn't hear me. Then I came up with the not-so-brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. I'd spent many years in the woods and learning how to blend in and be silent. As kids, we'd often sneak around and scare each other like that. So I silently sneaked down the second floor and out my back garage door which led to our backyard below my window which led to Terry's house off the side through our gravel area, then through a well-worn path through the woods about 25 feet long. My parents had to put in a gravel pit around the back of the house probably because nothing much grew due to the shade of the oak trees. There were 14 inch oak rounds set out as an uneven stepping path in the gravel and if you stepped off of the rounds, the crunch of the gravel and rocks would give you away. I picked my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark and I didn't see him. Also at that time I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling he went in, likely to bed. 
I waited a bit as I thought I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought it was odd that he'd be in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him. But I saw something human-sized and dark moving through the woods slow and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer and I definitely saw it, but it was strange in that it was not walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore, I hunched down and waited in silence, wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought it was Terry, and he saw me sneaking out and he was trying to scare me. I watched a dark outline of a human figure moving, but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening and checking every few feet while hiding, so I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry, but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so I quietly tiptoed back to my garage door and went back inside, silently locking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing and crouching. My window was open and I definitely heard someone or something walking around the yard. I whispered again for Terry out of my window but got no answer. And then I heard someone or something fall and grunt and moan pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough that I didn't mistake it and had sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with a window well, it's a semi-circle hole connected to the house dug out about three to four feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level and the hole lets some natural light in. There is no way Terry would have fallen in our window well. We had been playing hide and seek and many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everyone's window wells and house footprints, plus paths in the woods like the back of our hands. The grunt sounded humanish and not like an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. And that's when I realized that it wasn't a fun game and someone or something was out there and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best I could, but there was a screen on my windows to keep the bugs out so I couldn't lean my head out of the window to see next to the wall out of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks as whatever it was was stepping in the noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict and he was as good at being quiet as I was. Whatever it was stopped and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably a half hour. It seemed like an hour, but I'm sure I didn't have the patience back then to wait that long. I never heard it, him, her, or whatever it was leave, but I grew tired and eventually fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. But there were a few things that I'm certain of. It wasn't Terry. I asked him later and he said he went to bed that night when he got home and he also would have no reason to lie. I'm pretty sure it wasn't one of our neighbors, and I can't think of any reason a person would be there. We had few neighbors, and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again, these seven houses were spread out in about two and a half plus acres per home. There weren't any big animals in the area. As wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer, but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes. Plus, our dogs would scare them away so I kind of feel like there was just some random stranger wandering through the woods. For context, this happened 20 years ago just after Christmas. I had turned six a month prior. My mom went out one day and left my then 16-year-old cousin to look after me and my two older siblings, brother eight and sister 11. My cousin decided to take us out to the city, which was 10 minutes from where we lived. We took the bus, walked around the city in incredibly unsafe neighborhoods with basically another child responsible for us, and after a few hours got tired and decided to go home. The city had a central area for the buses, not a bus station, but like a huge perfectly square field with some plants and flowers and bushes. Lining all four sides along the street were a couple bus stops and benches, so basically you could catch several different buses from that area going all over the county and city. 
Since it was just after Christmas, the bushes along the field were still covered in Christmas lights. As we waited for the bus, I began to wander away as I admired the lights and my cousin none the wiser. At some point, I heard a man say hi. I looked up from the bush and he was smiling down at me. Thinking back on it, once I got older, it was clear that he was homeless and probably on something, like drugs. He had longish brown hair that was wet, teeth that were black along the gums, and his clothes were incredibly dirty and torn, and he had several jackets on. None of this really registered in my six-year-old brain, so I just smiled back up and said hi. He asked if I liked looking at the lights, and I said yes, they're pretty. He said, and I'll never forget this exact sentence, if you like Christmas lights, I've got some really cool lights at my house you'll love. You want to come see them? I eagerly said yes, so he reached his hand down to me and I took it. We started to walk away and we were headed to the corner of the field where a few big buildings were. He said his apartment was just a couple of blocks away, so we were headed around the corner of the building when my arm jerked backwards and I turned to see my sister pulling me away from him. He didn't say a single word, just instantly took off running. It took a few years for me to fully grasp the danger that I was in. My sister and brother talked about what happened a lot and how scary it was. When I finally got a little older, I appreciated how terrifying all that was and how close I was to having my life change or potentially end forever. If I had rounded that city corner with him, they never would have been able to find me in time because they wouldn't even know where to start looking before we disappeared around the corner and into the city. It's something we still bring up sometimes to this day. Who knows what would have happened. My dad always leaves the house around the same time. It's always before the sunrise. Not even 20 minutes, my dad is out walking and he sees a candle burning and goes on walking as once he's gotten closer, he sees what he thinks is a fire hazard and he's going to put the candle out. Then he realizes that it's an actual crime scene. There are decapitated animals that are surrounding the candle. My dad suspects the animals are a dog, two chickens, and a pigeon. He doesn't blow out the candle because it's a crime scene and he immediately calls the police. There's no blood soaked into the ground, no blood anywhere. The animals were decapitated in somewhere else. My dad was very disturbed. Who sacrifices animals and leaves a regular yoga candle? It said namaste on the outside. This is disturbing because months ago my dad was walking and taking pictures. He's a photographer. Then suddenly a girl in her late teens to 20s at the oldest tells him that he must follow her to see these mushrooms in a tree. He'd seen her before and said she reminded him of Wednesday Adams. They were far from the path and started acting too excited about the mushrooms. He realized the situation was weird and left, and not before she said that she'd see him again. So the police don't come right away, but they ask my dad and another one of his walking friends to give them their numbers. Finally, my dad got a call from his walking friend who'd given his number to the cops. And the cops were very lackadaisical. It seems like this isn't the first time they've found animals sacrificed in the woods. However, it turned out not being a dog, but was a goat. My dad took a different walk for two days, and he was very concerned. There was nothing he could really do, and this just happened, and I'm seriously scared at this point. My husband and I live in a ranch house with a basement. My parents also live in the house. The point of the story is, is that I'm scared about the animal sacrifice, and also the stalker girl who seemed to want to hurt my dad. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. You should come join. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. 
and check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, go on, get.